So let's start. I, my name is Anatoly Motkin. I'm president of Strategist. And today our Strategist live session is dedicated to digital transformation in Eurasia. Let me introduce first our distinguished guests, a former president of Estonia, Mr. Thomas Hendrik Ilves, a senior ICT policy specialist of World Bank, Natalia Gavanovska garcia and the Deputy Minister of Digital Transformation of Ukraine, Alexander Bornikov, is supposed to join us any minute. He had some uh, emergencies, so he promised to get back to us as soon as he can. So first uh, question, if I may address to you, Mr. Ilves. So a small country of Estonia has a, not only undergone a digital transformation under your leadership, but has also become one of the prominent centers of the development of the IT industry. What was the background for four unicorns to appear in the country with a population of just over a million people? And what are the successful actions of the state that led to this? Well, <laughs> I mean, first of all, you have to take into account just the individual initiative of people who did things. So that's already important. But, you know, the last year I was in office, uh, I, uh, I, when I, well, I always visited uh, companies, enterprises, startups, and but the last year I started asking them, so how did you get into this? Why did you do this? And I'd say about 80% of the time I was told by these people in their late 20s, early 30s that, oh, I was a student in that program that you started 20 years ago. And then I went back, well, that was one of my initial ideas. 93, 94, which I proposed to the government. I was not, I was a, just a, I was a diplomat, but I, I had so much experience with digital matters. I proposed that, look, we, our future is digital. Let's start getting kids online. Let's bring schools online. And, uh, okay, I won't go into all of the opposition that was this especially from the teachers and the teachers union who spent a year every week in the teachers newspaper telling everyone how what an idiot i was but in but in fact we got the program going so by 1998 all estonian schools were online with computer labs so this meant that you had basically all young people had access so this was more than 20 years ago and as always happens, I mean, most of them, they may play with it, they may learn sort of simple things, but it doesn't do anything. But there will always be four to seven or eight percent of those who will want to, they will be, okay, let me tear this down, let me break it, let me see how it works. And so we ha ended up with this large number of people who, um, who um, felt at home. The other factor I would say actually comes down to Skype. And this is just, uh, this is, you know, how things happen. I mean, Skype consisted of four young men at the time who um, were friends and had gone to school together. And they, they created an app or rather they, a program called um, Kaza, which was the file swapping program, which which basically was, it was just like Napster, but then they were, then the U.S. wanted to put them in jail. <laughs> but, but they managed to get out of that. They didn't go to jail, but then because what they, what a file swapping program was basically a, a sort of a, a, a more simple version of voice over, the voice over internet protocol, which we are using right now to talk to each other. But so they were the first company ever. I mean, they, they were the first ones to ever employ it. I mean, suddenly you had this huge success of a company from Estonia, Skype. And that what that meant was that suddenly all these people were saying, oh, I'm in poor little Estonia and the weather is terrible and I, I don't want to live here. Suddenly they saw that, oh, I could, I mean, some Estonian kids have created a worldwide brand. So I would say, the, on the one hand, the education side, and on the other hand, luck. The fact that we actually had a company like that made lots and lots of uh, young people want to do tech. Uh, and since then, that is what is, that's why we have so many startups and so many tech companies. I see. So, but uh, if, if we 
uh, talk about the <clears throat> digital uh, or digitalization of Estonia, it's not only the business, it's also the civil services. And uh, I remember your story about the uh, Estonia that is a uh, more expensive to drive through Estonia rather than through Latvia at some stage because uh, it was digital and you have no nobody to discuss your fines with. So maybe you could tell some, some more, provide some more information about the process of digitalization of um, of uh, Estonia and the uh, all civil services, but also a it's it's completely different country what I have seen through the Latin American conference last year. Well, basically what happened was that in the late 90s, we realized that digitization was something that were people liked, it was, it was popular, but, it, it, but we realized that if we're going to digitize governance, we have to solve fundamental issues, which have to do with security. It really comes down to the old um, New Yorker cartoon of two dogs and one dog says to the other, on the internet, no one knows you're a dog. Well, this is the problem of governance, is that uh, most countries do not have a secure identity, um, a unique identity for their citizens. So they do stupid things like, it's your email address plus a password. Of course, all passwords are breakable. A single factor identification system like that doesn't work. There is no end-to-end -end encryption. So basically what we did was give, and this is the one of the steps of political will, which was that we gave everyone a digital identity. It was mandatory because if you didn't make it mandatory, then, uh, and as, if you don't make it mandatory, it will, a digitization will go nowhere because, uh, and we see this from all of the European countries and all European countries are supposed to offer a digital identity, but most of them do it on a voluntary basis. And when it's voluntary, you'll get 15, 20% of the population will take it out. The rest won't. And so what does that mean? If you're in government or you're in the private sector, you'll say, okay, oh, well, look, 85% of the people don't have digital identities. Why should I, why should I invest in services? So the result is that they don't invest in services. So it's one of these, like, you know, you get your, it's a cash 22, it doesn't work. Uh, it's only when the private and public sectors know that everyone has a digital identity, will they be willing to invest in those services, which then bring new people into the process because they realize how much, how, e how much easier and more efficient it is for them. But is <laughs> You have to make it so that people will want to use the services, but they won't do it unless you have a mandatory digital identity. I see. Hey, th thank you, Mr. Illis, and welcome, uh, Alex Bornikov. I, I see that you've joined us. Uh, next question is uh, addressed to uh, Natalia. Uh, Natalia, World Bank uh, is conducting huge um, uh, projects uh, throughout Eurasian countries to develop the digital infrastructure in those countries, but also to uh, work on the uh, capacity building in those countries, both the human resources, but also to assist them with cybersecurity and also with digital resilience. So I, I know that it's too many uh, things to, to, uh, to get described in uh, five, 10 minutes, but I'd appreciate if you'll give us just an outline of your activity throughout this region. And then maybe afterwards uh, we will discuss uh, maybe particular some particular activity in Ukraine, please. Thank you, thank you very much, Anatoly, and thank you for having me. Uh, indeed, you know the, um, but I would like you know to say also a couple of work of the you know the very fundamental strategic objectives that the World Bank is pursuing. You know, while does any our project financing and any our policy dialogue. So I think uh, you know it's it's uh, our our two major strategic objectives are to fight poverty, but also to increase the shared prosperity, to promote it. And what does it mean, especially this last objective, is that the development and broader speaking, any economic you know uh, growth that we are trying to achieve shall be inclusive, shall be you know uh, uh, inclusive of all the uh, population, but especially inclusive for those bottom 40% of the population with the lowest income, because what we see is that even though economic development is happening, it not includes everyone. And this is what we're trying to 
uh, you know, avoid uh, through our engagement. So those two strategic objectives, they being carried through all the World Bank projects, including those projects in digital development and those projects we are having in the region that we're discussing today, right? So um, what are the priorities in the regions? What are our engagements? You know, I can make, give you one example with the number, you know, the number of the 4G uh, connections in the CIS region is just uh, one third of all the people living there. So uh, we are not talking about the wide adoption of technologies that can benefit those people, right? Connections of the broadband to the households, to the institutions, to the businesses, you know, it's even lower. So the uh, situation is even worse uh, for some groups of population in the urban areas. The affordability across the region varies dramatically. We have countries like uh, Tajikistan, where the, uh, the, the price of the internet is one of the highest we can find. And we have the countries like Ukraine, where services are very affordable. But the, 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 the thing of accessibility to the digital opportunities are equally a challenge, big or smaller one in all those countries. And that is one of very big our priorities. If we would look on the Central Asia, the bank has a program uh, developed a couple of years ago that we are carrying out through the countries. It's called uh, Digital CASA. Digital CASA is a series of projects uh, composing from three objectives. First of this objective is, of course, connectivity itself. The second objective is uh, platforms and entrepreneurship. So here we speak about the government platforms, data centers, but we speak also about the some support towards IT sector development in principle. And we speak about the enabling environment composing from legal and regulatory reforms, especially in the region of Central Asia. The barrier of infrastructure is huge, but the barrier in legal and regulatory reform is also very profound. And we're trying to attend to this very much. Uh, if we will speak about the, um, uh, the where this program is already under implementation, now it captures three countries. It's ongoing project investment financing in Kyrgyzstan, uh, with the biggest component being connectivity, but then also, you know, those other areas are definitely captured there. We have a project under uh, final stages of preparation in Uzbekistan as part of this program. And we are at early discussions of having this, uh, this project in Tajikistan. Um, that, that is bigger project that the region we're discussing. Uh, one of the countries also part of this program is, for instance, Afghanistan, because geographically this is a very close proximity. So we're looking at this region as a, um, uh, as a one from where we stand. But uh, for instance, if we will take Kazakhstan, there we also have a project is not so directly the project uh, related to, to digital CASA, but it, it has its similarities right there. We are looking at the support towards uh, uh, more advanced technologies such as artificial intelligence, right? And uh, all associated data ecosystem related to that. Support towards smart cities. So the, those, those I would say are the major engagements that, uh, of digital development we are having in that region. Biggest priority for the bank, not only to create those opportunities, but to make them available to everybody living there. Um, if we would look at the South Caucasus countries there, you know, we believe that the heavy lifting is still, you know, is still remains with making the infrastructure available to everyone. As have mentioned, uh, you know, the, the president in his, in his uh, remarks just before me, the, the things that they did, they brought everybody online. And then you don't know who will do what and what will emerge from this. So cutting 50% of your population from this opportunity is unthinkable. So it should be brought to everywhere. And then it will start uh, like moving by itself as well. You know, so we believe that's very important. We are having kind of preparation of project in Georgia, login Georgia, and that, that project looks very much into helping government to bring infrastructure into all the areas, but also then helping those areas to take advantage of those technologies that this infrastructure can bring. But there is nothing to talk about if the infrastructure is not there. You know? 
we have a dialogue uh, with Ukraine, and I'm very happy to to meet here virtually our our counterpart from the Ministry of Digital Transformation. Our initial conversations also relate to the availability of, of, of that infrastructure, especially now in the context of COVID, we all have learned how important that really is to have uh, everybody online for business continuity, for public institutions to work, for school to uh, experience uh, less of educational losses. So I think that we will be looking at, 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 those, um, at those areas more broadly. So uh, I would say that that's, that's the mix of our, our engagement. We do much more than that, of course. We develop digital skills, uh, uh, helping people to learn work online. The mix will depend on the country. Priorities we are discussing with the government. But I will say opening digital opportunities to everyone is a priority that we try to carry through all our engagement. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Natalia. And there's a, uh, Mr. Ivas, so you had some remarks. So a brief one. Uh, the issue of uh, access is really the one that uh, I see in most of these countries is a problem. And it's not simply a matter of infrastructure, or except well, at least simple infrastructure. And in the 90s, in the late 90s, we figured five to 8% of the population actually had a computer, personal computer at home. Uh, today it's 90 in every, I mean, in households. But so one of the things we did was um, say, okay, uh, schools will have computer labs and be connected, but, but they have to be open to the public. We took it a step further, and this was where banks were very important was that we then had uh, computer banks or labs, meaning in places where you have computers, uh, in every single municipal office. So every little village, uh, you could go in and use the computer. So, because, so just the simple connectivity of, I mean, having a computer in your home, that was a step away. Our problem was that people didn't have access to computers. And so we did that. And we, one of the things that was crucial for us, of course, was that uh, we, it was government, it was, an, it were, there were NGOs who were very excited, but there was also the banks, because the banks realized that if they, if they had to have every little village had to have at least two banks in it, that would cost a lot of money. In, I mean, labor costs, rental costs. And they said, well, if we can get everyone to bank online, you know, we can close them down which is why they supported financially this program to put computers into municipal buildings, to support education programs in, for older people in rural areas. So that's one way we get this very high level of digitization is that, that even before you get to the level of wealth that allows everyone to have their computer you can give them access to computers. Uh, and so when we talk about access, it's not simply having broadband, it's a matter of actually getting two computers and having someone there who can teach the old, you know, babushka, this is how you do your banking. Um, and that's crucial, I think. And the other comment I was gonna say is that, yeah, the, the legal infrastructure of doing this is absolutely vital. You have to, you have to make sure that the legal grounding for digitization is there to prevent problems in the future. And uh, it, it, that's a messy process. I mean, to get, to figure out what can be connected to what and to ensure people's trust in the system, that took a number of years to work out all of the connections. But anyway, that's enough for me. Thank you. So uh, again, uh, 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 welcome, Mr. Bornikov. And the question is very simple. I think that uh, it's obvious, actually, that the current uh, government is the most uh, digital, digitally oriented government uh, all over the newest uh, history of Ukraine. And your yeah, ministry yeah. is in charge of digital transformation of uh, Ukraine. Uh, and uh, one of your uh, flagship projects, DIA, is uh, in the air. And more than 3 million people, as I know, according to your minister, have downloaded this uh, app to their smartphones, and they may, President Zelensky declared the, the the state in the smartphone is his priority, and the idea is actually the first uh, milestone, the first step in in the right direction. 
and maybe you could tell a couple of words about this app, but also about your uh, objectives and uh, how do you see this digital development and digital uh, uh, development of digital infrastructure also in Ukraine? And one more word, I think that to combat the corruption and to tackle the corruption, it's not less important to chase the corrupted pers people, also to create an environment, transparent environment, where the corruption has no space. And I think that your steps in this de developing those uh, digital services for the population leaves less space for corruption in Ukraine. So please, the floor is yours. Well, well, first of all, thank you for your invitation, and I'm glad to be among people uh, like Natalia and Thomas today and speak about those issues, which is um, kind of important right now. Well, um, let me first start from from the ministry objective because uh, it relates in the in her, it reflects from for, from what previous uh, speakers said because we kind of I, I believe we understand issues the, the same way and we are on the same page here because um, basically the ministry and he, and he said it right that's the first time in history someone actually. Uh, have seriously taken this as a priority and and and, and dedicated separate resources, uh, which is a ministry. With the, right now we are closing to only two hundred people. Of course, that's not enough, but but still, we have a bunch of we have the whole bunch of people dedicated doing everyday job to change a lot of uh, government services, government approach. To people and how they how they being perceived by by citizens. So uh, going back to the ministry priorities and what I was saying that um, the whole concept about uh, smartphone government and smartphone uh, was not possible without two other pillars: infrastructure and digital skills and. I think it was something something similar than in Estonia, but uh, a few years after, um, and uh, we still have a lot of uh, territory not covered, but by broadband internet. But we dedicated uh, separate resources. So, and my colleague, another deputy minister, is specifically in charge of building this infrastructure. And one of the, the achievements that we now freeing the 900 frequency, GSM frequency. So basically, uh, we understood that it's almost impossible to cover this with with the wires. And our uh, um, our vision is to extend the mobile network and we moved to, we're moving to 4g and since starting from july we'll be able to use 900 frequency so we actually going to double um coverage uh, of the current network that's the was that's the one priority of the ministry another priority is also digital skills and this this is really complicated issue <laughs> uh and my colleague her name is valeria she's in charge of uh, uh of the specific goal which is teach 2 million people basic digital skills. So we perform a, a sort of a quiz and, and, and research, and we found out that we kind of like in the middle, it's like more than around 50% of people, well, they don't follow uh, what's going on. So they, some of them have smartphones, but they have only, the, the, the only application that can use is, is Viber. <laughs> but that's that's a huge success already, but, but still, uh, they're afraid of, and we figure out also, and it's in our research that um, our research showed that people are afraid of communicating government with government through digital channels. So it's another issue that we're facing that we we have to convince them that this is safe. This is uh, this is actually works, and um, of course, the top priority, they're uh, moving. 100% of the digital digital services online. That's the top top, top priority for, for for the ministry. And it's actually like, I would say like 60% of its job. And DIA, uh, which is uh, kind of acronym for uh, three words: government and I. And um, that's the application that you, you mentioned the three million downloads. That's the first time in history of Ukraine uh, when 
right? when application and App Store got so many downloads and, and also in Google Play, but, uh, but still, and um, um, people actively using it, it and, it's, and it's the first time in history when something produced by government get so much success. This is absolutely absolute success. And um, but just a few words about how 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 we think it uh, will work work right now, uh, will work in the future. So basically, an application in in a smartphone, we're going to have all these digital papers and the basic services. But we're also doing portal, uh, which is of course it, it will be available from your phone, but it's more like on the desktop. Uh, Based because uh, the, 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 there's some of the um, services which is so hard to uh, maintain uh, in, in, from the UX user experience standpoint from the smartphone because some you know some services require a lot of uh, fields to fill in and um, and now it's the work is divided so basically in smartphone you have all your, of your digital papers like uh, passport driver license car insurance, car title, um, student ID, pension ID. Um, well, you can actually uh, start a business from the phone, create a private inter entrepreneurship uh, instance. Uh, we now work on moving uh, creation of uh, enterprise online. And uh, right now you, you can also, for instance, apply uh, for unemployment uh, support from your smartphone not going to um, uh, government institution anymore. Um, when you deliver a baby, you don't, ha you don't have to go to a number of uh, physical locations in order to get it registered. So we are doing many things in order to make people, I would say, happy uh, from interaction with the government because they're really unhappy now. I mean, they, they hate uh, uh, interaction with government. And, and we feel that you know, that's kind of something that we moved on for the first time in history. And uh, personally, I'm glad to be part of this of those changes. Of course, there's a lot of problems, but I feel that with the president's support, and since you also mentioned that he's declared that this is his priority, that really helps. So we in line uh, from from gov uh, from presidential uh, uh, branch to your. Uh, Parliament branch to legislature branch, and since we uh, and we are executive branch, of course. Um, I don't know what else uh, can I tell you. Or, um, I don't know. We, we have big plans, and uh, uh, that's that's not just related about uh, related to government services, but the whole idea is to um, move Ukraine out of uh, I would say industry. Uh, and not a production economy to high tech economy. So that's kind of like long term vision of ours. Well, I'm, I'm, I think I'm done. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you, Alex. And uh, follow up to you, Natalia. Uh, if, if we may uh, look on your uh, activity in this region, uh, how much are you assisted by private market or your uh, counterparts are always the government and you prefer not to collaborate with the private market and uh, big uh, companies like Google, Microsoft and other giants, global tech giants uh, in this region? So uh, thank you for the question, Anatoly. Let me first follow up a little bit on what previous speakers have said and then attend to your question. So very quickly on the access to devices that the, the President Ilves have mentioned, very important, yes, and what we see from different study, including the recent study of McKinsey, is that the biggest amount of mobile traffic will be transferred through the smartphone. So access of the, to the smartphones in principle is very important, equally important as access to the computers. And that also confirms the, the directions, you know, that the Ukrainian government is taking. So that's, that's just uh, one comment to make. Then when we speak about the uh, impact, you know, is that of course you, um, the, 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 I think that the game changer, the IT sector itself is a small sector, it's in best case scenario, 11% of the GDP. You know, but the value of this sector is in its ability to penetrate and to benefit other sectors of the economy, real sectors of the economy. So we are not talking about moving to digital because we it's fun or because 
you know, we want to do it because it's, it's more than and it's innovative. No, we are doing it because to, it is becoming 50 percent or, or 20 times, you know, in some countries less expensive to provide government services. Do you know that to provide government service in rural area is from 30 to 50 percent more expensive than in urban area? Developing EGAP actually is a saving public funds that could be directed somewhere else. So all this digitalization is a very pragmatic process that is taking place and IT sector plays a key role in that. The same benefits it provides to all the other sectors in the economy, take agriculture, take transport, take all of that. This is where will be the real benefits and that's why we're talking about the digitalization and this is where the real value of IT is. So, that's uh, very much you know, part of, of, of what the World Bank does. But of course, all this relies on top of the infrastructure and then you know, there are very complex conversations related to cybersecurity and, and skills and, and, and all the rest. Now answering your question, you know, I think when we speak about the digital, you know, this is one of the few sectors which is very much liberalized everywhere. Like you look at telecom operators, you know, take same Ukraine, we speak thousands you know, all of them are private. You know, the, the, the sector itself is very much private sector. So, I mean, whatever government does, you know, it needs to consider this fact, you know, and whatever collaborations that could be developed with the private sector is very, very, very important, you know, because we need to build it together. The private sector contributes very much if we want them to invest you know, we need to talk about, you know, what, what environment is favorable, how this can be improved. And only if nothing works, the government shall, re, you know, I, I wouldn't dare to say what replace, but complement those investments where we observe the market favors. And, and that is very much applicable to collaboration with the national companies. That's very much applicable to collaboration with the international companies. Because when we speak about the, for instance, uh, foreign uh, investments in the countries, in very many instances, those are IT investments. You know, those are the companies who are investing everywhere and creating jobs, same Google, same Amazon Web Services, same other big companies. You know, they bring a lot of, uh, a lot of, uh, you know, advantages when, when environment is right. So absolutely, you know, the World Bank, uh, you know, Keeps, keeps the dialogue and uh, we have our own uh, in the World Bank group, a branch who uh, uh, provides financing to the private sector, but the World Bank or IBRD or IDA, you know, which are part of the World Bank group where I work, uh, we primarily focus on the, on the financing of the governmental projects. So the government, are our counterpart, but uh, the government cannot do it alone by themselves. So collaboration is unavoidable and is very much needed and beneficial. Thank you. <laughs> and if I may address a question asked by our one of our attendees, uh, virtual attendees, uh, Vyacheslav Pituskan, to Mr. Ilves. Uh, so what were the main challenges Estonia had when introducing and implementing mandatory ID cards? That um, the first was financial, which is understandable. Um, well, people didn't understand what what it's for. I mean, this is why you have to develop services in parallel so that um, so that there's actually some benefit to it. I mean, you know, it was uh, at the time it became uh, it was uh, the first the only thing that the ID cards actually gave you, even though it had a chip in it, was that. You didn't have to take a passport to travel. You could just you in the European Union. It was enough to travel having an ID. That was just. Um, but the, you want to quickly offer services that people like. So I mean, the, the most obvious one is, of course, banking and also doing your taxes. That you can, in fact, um, start banking anyway. Um, which everyone does, but when you actually interact with the government. Of course, having an, uh, having your taxes basically done for you ahead of time, for at least anyone who is a salaried employee, was a uh, was a big um, was a big uh, positive side of it. And of course, we adopted some uh, policies, such as if you filed your taxes digitally, you would get your money back faster, much faster. Um, 
uh, so and if you did it on paper well it would uh, it would they would only get to the paper taxes when the other when the digital side had been done and uh, of course it's very easy to do your taxes if the government has calculated basically how much you've gotten and what you owe or how much you get back and all of your contributions they're all listed there and so this was something that people really liked because it takes five minutes to do your taxes. I mean, if you're a business, it's a little more difficult, but not much. It's still easier. And so, I mean, this is one of the lessons people, I always tell people is that why, I mean, how does it work? And I say, you must start off with services that people like. Uh, another service that people really like is the digital prescription, which now is in a lot of places, but I mean, it's, we were the first. Basically, this means the doctor puts the prescription into the computer system and you can go to any pharmacy, ID yourself with your card and you get your prescription. Uh, we've now taken it a step further in that, um, uh, which is instructive. I mean, I proposed 10 years ago to the president of Finland that, well, since all these Finns come and visit Estonia, they need a drink. Um, but uh, you, they have this, they adopt, Finland adopted our uh, architecture. We created our own architecture in Finland and 14 other countries have now taken it over, which is open source, non-proprietary thing. I said, well, you have the same architecture as we do. Why don't we do it? So a Finn coming to Estonia or an Estonian going to Finn, if he gets sick, he can use the, he can take out a prescription. And that again shows you the kinds of things you can do once you have, uh, I mean, the kind of conveniences that people have. Um, so my my advice is always like focus, focus on those things that people will like. I mean, what happens with governments is that oh, we can digitize, and we'll make the working of government for us better. Finance ministries especially love it. Uh, obviously, and taxes, tax bureaus love it because it's easier to get things, information. But what you have to focus on is getting the service user friendly for the people using them, and then they will use it. Uh, and that's, um, I mean, that's a general lesson, I would say. I mean, across the board, we just then proceeded to uh, look at all of the problems that people have and try to find digital services. Um, Someone mentioned here about you know when you're when a child is born, right? I mean, this is a, a terrible. I mean, it's I mean, it's, a, it's a wonderful event. It's a terrible process, and you have to you know, birth certificate, registration, blah. blah I mean, healthcare, doctors, and so well, that's one of those life events that uh, really is quite traumatic. For uh, usually, it's the father who has to run around to every single office. So we just made it simple. You just, as soon as the child is born, all you have to do is say what the child's name is. The hospital informs the population registry. You get your ID, you're registered where you live, you get your health insurance, you get your, what all this stuff you get. So those are all the kinds of, I mean, the government needs to look at the services it provides from the point of view of the citizen and making his or her life easier, not about making the life of the government easier. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And uh, I have a question to uh, Deputy Minister Bornyakov. Uh, so now we have, uh, in the, we're in the middle of a COVID, COVID pandemic and many of uh, countries cope with one of the means is digital means, are digital means that they cope with this uh, pandemic. So first, I would like to ask you uh, what actually the new developed tools, how are they helpful to you as a government to work with the, uh, with the, those circumstances? And the second one is uh, what are your um, observations? So what do you think you have you concluded from this pandemic and what could be the new tools that you would develop and would become part of the government and the smartphone in Ukraine? Well, well, first of all, uh, we, uh, I think one of our official, I mean, and it's the, the one official 
application that we did for um, for maintaining people uh, under surveillance and and, and uh, monitoring they staying home uh, is being done by us, and it was done for everyone who was coming from outside, uh, and uh, they were registered as as uh, someone who has to stay to, like two weeks and and and, and detain himself. Uh, so we, we create an app that monitor them, uh, how they, about their progress, how, if, if they really stay home. So that's, that's, that's what we did by our, uh, our own resources. Um, so how it basically works, because there's a lot of, um, uh, superstitions and <laughs> rumors about that. Uh, that's not basically some, some application that, uh, that, that uh, violate your privacy. So first of all, when you come back from uh, from Italy, for, for instance, you have you give a permission to, and you kind of obliged to stay home for two weeks. So, uh, so this application basically, so we know this, we we, we have gotten this database of, of the people, name and phones, and uh, the the application when you install it, it, it asks you for your phone number, and and then if you um, enter it into your application, it sends you uh, a message. And if uh, this number matches your um, the, the database, uh, the number in database, and only after that, the application starts to work. So it's not for everyone because there was a, like uh, the, gov uh, the government, the Minister of Digital Transformation created an application to monitor every, every citizen in the country <laughs> violating privacy. So it was, it was a, lot, a lot of, uh, you know, um, uh, buzz about that. Uh, but also, we came up. We, we figured out that it's impossible to to uh, I don't know to follow up with all this uh, initiative by on up by using our own resources. So we announced a sort of a hackathon. We we, we gave them pretty much good price, like one hundred fifty thousand dollars for for not just for one winner, but for a couple winners. And we have got like ninety nine hundred applications in just a couple of days. Uh, then we uh, we kind of uh, created a this, this is, is, is a uh, well this was a, co a, a contest and a competition so people oh, uh, sorry for <laughs> for the small interruption uh, so uh, basically there's like uh, we um, there's a seventy best ideas that we evaluated deeply in detail and then gave them like uh, almost 10 of them i think eight or nine of them money and and they started to to work on implementation so this is was our way to help them uh well um in terms of my biggest lesson you know um i kind of like the expression that i recently read and and i it, it, it's the best thing i heard from, from for the last months um and i quote here so it's funny to observe how our economy is about to collapse because people started to consume only what they need. <laughs> so that's my uh, that's my like a top observation of uh, what's going on, and I'm, and uh, I, I kind of think thoughtful about it. I was like, wow, that's really something that happens. Like, uh, well, how people were consuming so much crap before, and this is how this economy is built on. So many luxury on uh, or any other not actually necessary items in our life, and when it st started about just only necessary thing, it's 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 economy um, um, faced its uh, worst fears. But uh, but that's that's kind of my personal observation. But again, uh, in terms of uh, government work in the business, um, I was kind of impressed how. Uh, business quickly moved to uh, online, and that, that's that's one of the things that, that amazed me a lot because it does like people uh, um, they change their plans and, and about also about digitalization about communication with each other and some 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 of the companies are so reactive they haven't implemented any online uh, tools for like decade and then in couple months, boom, done. So that, I, I think that's a big step forward in terms of how once pandemic is over, and I'm 
personally believe, honestly believe is going to be over soon. Um, how business will speed up quickly and after learn, uh, after he, it's learned its lesson. So that would be all. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Alex. And uh, back to you, Natalia. I, many of your activity, World Bank activity, was about traveling and meeting people in those countries and negotiating with them. So we know that the, the current pandemic influenced the global uh, diplomacy. How did it influence your work of World Bank and of, on program and play, your program's implementation in this Eurasian region? And also, I, how have you adjusted your programs? I know that your programs are long running, but still, I, have, have been a, any adjustments conducted to your programs, long running programs in this region because of the current pandemic, please? Thank you very much for the question, very relevant questions for us, you know, first of all, working from home for a second month now, same for everybody, I think our offices in China, the first that were that were put on hold. Operationally speaking from the implementation, of course, some programs have slowed down, uh, but also from the portfolio perspective, there was some reprogramming going on across the portfolio, definitely giving a tremendous priority to the health and social sectors. Uh, we have put in place the whole program of the, um, how do you say, standardized project to, that we were able to prepare and to deliver in the matter of weeks to the government because to, to respond to the existing, uh, you know, economic crisis that everybody are facing. On the implementation side, our project implementation units uh, continue to work definitely because of the some um, you know, uh, we are not able to conduct face-to-face -face surveys, as you can imagine, as well as many other activities. So there are things slowing down. But, you know, this crisis, I think, also brought a lot of visibility, you know, to, to the ways that we can really work, you know, differently. And still things can be done about that. I, I would like to quote here one study that I have just, was just recently published, you know, it was analyzing the um, uh, economic uh, recovery and, and mitigation of economic losses of SARS uh, pandemic in, in 2003. And the, and the country has found that countries with a developed infrastructure, digital infrastructure, were able to alleviate by 75% the economic losses associated with the SARS epidemic and the socioeconomic impact of the sanitary measures taken. Like social distancing and everything that we see now. So, you know, in this, you know, even applying this to COVID, which is even greater, you know, would allow us even more. Of course, we do not fly, but things can get done. You know, we are now preparing, for instance, emergency project in Turkey, which has to do with developing national wide online education platforms. They do have it, but the platform was not designed for attending 18 million pupils, 1 million teachers, you know, and then their parents, you know, so that's something that is very important. We all want to see this pandemic over, but we just don't know when it will be and how soon the next one will return. And I think that there is before and there is after that we're talking about here. And I think that the sector we're discussing now will allow us all, you know, to be more resilient to what's coming. Thank you, Natalia. And uh, yes, please, Mr. Ilves. I think you really ought to use the crisis as much as possible. I am uh, advising the Greek government on digitization and have been for the past, but ever since the new government came in, they made digitization of government uh, a priority. And so I, I drew up a plan for them of things they have to deal with. They kept saying, oh, no, this is so hard. Oh, no, this is not. This is going to take forever to do because all the civil servants will object. Now, with COVID, uh, I mean, you know, the old Rahm Emanuel expression, never let a good crisis go to waste. Well, they are really using it. So they have rammed through digitization of services in two, three months that they thought would take a year or two years and that were part of this long long timetable uh, so my my words to to whatever government 
is an interest in digitization to push these things through now because people are, are I mean, it's you will have much less opposition when you try to do it in normal conditions. You will have everyone saying this is, oh, this is terrible. This is terrible. Okay, you'll make mistakes. So what? We made everyone makes mistakes, but just use use the opportunity right now to go ahead. Uh, on the educational side, I'd say that we've been using digital education for almost 20 years, and it has now really taken off. Again, thanks to the COVID crisis, because um, we had all the, the, the ch everything was set up, but it wasn't used by teachers very much. Um, now they're forced to use it. And now, I mean, because we had the fundamental infrastructure, both the uh, physical as well as the kind of intellectual and pedagogical infrastructure set up, it was a very easy transition to go to educating people online because all the things that you that used to be done on paper and that already are done only digitally, you know, sort of following students' grades and parent teacher consultations, all of that is exists. So now so there are two aspects to what I'm saying. One is that push through reforms now, and secondly, take the things that you have and make them uh, widely used. I mean, those two are these are the two benefit. Well, benefits the wrong word, but I mean, just to to use a bad situation to get, at least get something done. Um, since we have, uh, I mean, in Estonia, there are only three uh, government uh, citizen interactions that you cannot do online. That's getting married, getting divorced, and uh, and selling property. Um, the last one is important because of uh, a common, our common neighbor, either to the east or the north, that uh, we didn't want them using anonymous shell companies to buy property. So you, you have to show up. That keeps them, I mean, then you have real companies. Um, but all, everything else you can do online, which means that it actually helps. Because you don't have to stand in line in, in all the different places that you used to have to stand in line. And this is very different from Silicon Valley, where you can't do most things. I mean, this is the absurdity of where I where I am right now, which is in Palo Alto, where in a 12 kilometer radius, I have the headquarters of Tesla, Apple, Google, Facebook, Palantir, YouTube, and government services are at the Soviet level. Pardon me, but they are. It's all only paper. You cannot do anything online. Um, push these things through now, please. That would be my sort of big advice. Use COVID what, however you can to get people used to being, uh, to do, dealing with the government through, I mean, doing it through digital means and not paper. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Elvis. And uh, I would have a question too. Uh, we have just uh, six minutes left. Uh, to Natalia. Natalia, tell me please, uh, from your perspective, how do you think all those countries in the Eurasian region could be helpful to each other to develop their digital infrastructure and how they should be connected? Because sometimes, even while, while, when you have digital CASA project in Central Asia, you have specific program for Uzbekistan and then for Tajikistan. And sometimes I have feeling that the wheel is reinvented, it's been reinvented. So how do you think the, in those countries, uh, we should uh, we could choose uh, and use uh, some countries or their experience as a role model, as Estonia uh, has been discussed today, or others, or Belarus or Ukraine, and uh, some others. And we could, on the first hand, we could save some time. Uh, and the other hand, other hand, do you see any synergy in implementing your programs in different countries in this region, please? Thank you. Uh, absolutely. You know, I but I believe that you know. Uh, even the most traditional experience sharing, you know, in different areas, you know, like extending infrastructure or let's say cybersecurity, you know, which is particular things you have to do everywhere. And with digital ID mentioned so many times now, I just feel obliged to say how important data privacy and cybersecurity uh, really is frameworks related to everything digital. You know, I would say that, you know, definitely we need to talk more the countries need to talk more. You know, that's the most human thing. This is how you transfer experience. 
we need to talk more to each other, to our neighbors, you know, to establish the sort of dialogue, you know, event like this, specific groups like that. In the EU, you know, uh, the very group among the regulators, you know, allows us to, I'm from Lithuania myself, that's why I'm mentioning this example, but allowed a lot of us to learn about the, I don't know, broadband projects from inside, the regulation approaches, you know, things like this. I believe that that region, you know, really needs that, needs that. And we have this history among us that we share, you know, each time I go to Georgia or, or, or I speak to, to Ukrainians, you know, we, we feel, we feel like helping each other, you know, we feel like sharing this experience with each other. I think we just need to do more of that. And yes, there is no need to reinvent the wheel. The broadband project is the same project everywhere. Same with the ID, broadband strategy, cybersecurity, you name it, you know, lots of experience. Many things have been done. No need to reinvent. The bank is, is, is there for, for those countries as well. Thank you, Nat. Mr. Bornikov, the question is uh, to, to you is, from your perspective, sometimes international financial institutions and the uh, different uh, aid agencies and also some uh, uh, advisory offices see what is best to be done in Ukraine from their perspective. Now, if I'll ask you a little bit tricky question, what do you expect, what kind of assistance would you expect from international financial institutions like World Bank, BRD and others, from aid agencies like USAG, Z, uh, CDA and others, and from different, uh, even uh, thought leaders like Mr. Ilves and others who have a huge experience in uh, their lifetime uh, in, uh, in, 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 in working and digitalizing, digitalizing different countries where they were, had a huge responsibility for it. Please. Foreign official, uh, we constantly work in, uh, with the Institution that you mentioned, but yes, uh, yes, aid, and um, um, I'm not talking directly to World Bank, but uh, international financial uh, IFC. We 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 interact with them, and and currently we're in, in discussing a project, a, a pretty huge project, a pretty big project, but probably we can work on together. And um, well, my personal uh, feedback that they're kind of responsive, and they they are really willing to help. Um, uh, we certainly have a lot of intention in, in terms of, uh, and, and in our financing, in terms to make government transparent. Uh, what I mean is uh, uh, DIA was not uh, possible without help of TAPAS and you for digital projects and, and some other initiative, initiatives uh, from USAID. It's, uh, I don't remember their program, it's called... Um, something about entrepreneurship and they also give money for like learning digital skills and 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 we are uh we're using this help as much as we can i know they're they're helping for from for many other uh, uh initiatives and i'm not personally related to you but i i heard of course but you know but in terms of what can be improved um i can say my personal feedback that um you know they um uh, uh, it's more about uh, international monetary fund. They are too uh, strict about uh, stress, stressing a little bit in, in a good sense, stressing, um, not stressing, I'm not, uh, let's forget this, let's put this word aside, but trying something new, something creative in terms of uh, economy approach. And, uh, and they uh, trying to keep us uh, in the, in the certain thresholds and parameters, financial parameters. And sometimes it's hard to push uh, really creative initiatives. And because uh, when, you add, when you pitch them, they say like, look, this could disrupt uh, financial stability and we are too afraid and let's not do that. Let's keep it, let's keep it low or keep it steady. And, uh, but, uh, I don't think we, we need to make it like a frog leap, you know, uh, and and I personally feel that it's for the Ukrainian economy and this, uh, the, well, this th those fears from international partners, not always good. But, well, I'm, I'm not here to judge because I'm, maybe I can't see the whole picture, but 
uh, I I personally faced with uh, some issues when we were offering some like really disruptive things, and and then it was like, look, let's let's make it step by step, maybe in years, and then you're like, oh, that's that's not going to work in this. That's the window of opportunity right now, and we and we have to jump. And <laughs> no, we don't want to jump. We 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 make everything by procedures. That's a protocol, and um, and maybe last but small suggestion. Uh, my personal experience working with those partners, they are way slow. Like if you want to uh, make a, a, a whole program and support for, for instance, like, I don't know, digital skills program, like really improving uh, people's digital skills, you have to spend like six months with them. And then, uh, well, when it's all approved and, and money is in place, then of course it goes fast, but, but the preparation is, it's like, it's, <laughs> from three to six months so that's that's what be my uh, answer thank you thank you Prime minister thank you I, I we actually have to wrap up our uh, session today thank you for all of you to mr elvis to a uh, miss gilovanova and to uh, mr bornikov for uh, coming uh, today to joining us today and it was really fruitful discussion discussion and they uh, will put it online and send you a link so you could also watch not only those who watched us on a uh, online live Thank you so much. Thank you.